Good morning, and welcome to Emerald Ashbore University. I'm coming to you from Michigan State University in East Lansing. This is Robin Osborne, and along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from The Ohio State University Extension and Dr. Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University, we welcome you to today's presentation by Dr. Donald Egan on Emerald Ashbore in Pennsylvania. Dr. Egan has been the Forest Health Manager and the Chief of the Division of Forest Pest Management in the De Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources Bureau of Forestry since October of 2001. The division is responsible for protecting forest lands from insects, diseases, and other factors affecting forest health. He specializes in forest insect defoliators and non-native forest insects, like emerald ash borer, and other forest diseases, and has worked on invasive species for 37 years. We're very happy that he's able to bring his expertise to us today. Before we get started, I want to remind you that your comments and questions are welcome today. Please feel free to write them in the chat pod on the left of your screen. We will make a note of them, and Don will respond to your questions after his presentation so that we can keep the flow of the webinar smooth. Your feedback is also very important for us to keep these free webinars coming, so please stay tuned till the end when we will be providing a link to a survey that we hope you'll take the time to fill out today. For those of you needing CEUs, either your survey information or an email to Amy Stone, whose email address is provided in the notes box on the bottom left of your screen, is necessary for us to process them. We can only give credits for the live session, not the recorded version. And Amy asks that you let her know what type of CEUs or certificate that you might need. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at emeraldashboard.info. You will also find recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today. And Don, welcome. And now you can take it away. Thank you, Robin. And I'd like to thank the folks at EAB University uh, for inviting me to um, talk about our Emerald Ash Borer program in Pennsylvania. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that various parts of the presentation uh, today were prepared uh, by myself and our forest entomologist, Dr. Ho Ping Liu, our uh, Bureau of Forestry's uh, Civil Culture uh, Section Chief, Scott Miller, and our community uh, Emerald Ash Borer intern, uh, Kendra McMillan. What I'd like to go over uh, today is a little bit about our Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources uh, Bureau of Forestry and our division and talk about our emerald ash borer situation and ash resources in, in Pennsylvania and then give you a little bit of a history of uh, where we got started, uh, various pilot projects, and then the development of first our community plans and templates in dealing with our state parks, then our state forest, and then we'll have some time for some, some questions. Our Division of Forest Pest Management was originally started way back in the early 1970s actually as a result of gypsy moth, but we, do, we still do gypsy moth suppression in Pennsylvania, but we do a whole host of other things, a lot of surveys, a lot of monitoring, and these days it seems most of the things that we work on are invasive species like the emerald ash borer. Uh, we still have suppression programs for gypsy moth, hemlock woolly adelgid, and emerald ash borer, biocontrol programs for uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, elongate hemlock scale, and emerald ash borer. A lot of training, a lot of out education and outreach. And we also do a lot of cooperative research, and I want to point that out. This would be a really, really short talk if we didn't have the researchers such as Cliff Sadoff at Purdue and Deb McCullough at Michigan State and Dan Herms at Ohio State. And, and being a University of Michigan alum, that's uh, you know, sometimes tough to give a, uh, a lot of credit to the other, uh, uh, some of those schools, but a lot of very good work's done. I, all of this information and methods and methods development were um, produced by universities and U.S. Forest Service 
Forest Health Protection and uh, 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 U.S. Forest Service Research. Uh, the other thing that uh, we do a lot of, both for private landowners and other state agencies, is a, a lot of management recommendations on how to deal with forest health issues. And it's not just pests, it's also um, other factors and disturbance uh, affecting uh, forest health. In Pennsylvania, we have a lot of uh, cooperators. We do have a Pennsylvania Forest Pest Task Force. This task force actually began as an emerald ash borer task force, and we've since expanded under our Pennsylvania Invasive Species Council, and it's a collection of state uh, agencies and uh, uh, other organizations, uh, sort of at the program manager level where we get together and decide on how we're going to deal with the various invasive insects and diseases that we have, um, one of which is the spotted lanternfly, which is a fulgored insect that was just discovered in North America in southeastern PA. We do a lot of cooperative work with our Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture people, other bureaus within uh, the uh, state agencies, especially those that manage lands like the Bureau of State Parks and Department of Transportation. In Pennsylvania we also have a game commission, the Turnpike Commission. Uh, so we deal with those managers and, and management of their lands and obviously we do a lot of work with Penn State Extension. I uh, want to really point out the cooperation and um, organization of the Pennsylvania Community Forest Council. That's our rural, our rural community forestry council. Uh, they've been uh, very instrumental in our work, especially with Emerald Ash Borer. And also our federal cooperators, the U.S. Department of Ag, Plant Protection and Quarantine, and um, both U.S. Forest Service uh, for self-protection and research. Emerald Ash Borer. Originally discovered in western Pennsylvania in 2007, uh, just north of Pittsburgh, right where the Pennsylvania Turnpike and I-79 come together. As a matter of fact, two USDA APHIS inspectors had just gone across the border into Ohio. Um, the, la the first rest stop in on the Ohio Turnpike had finally got Emerald Ashbore, and they were on their way back. They stopped for lunch. One guy went to an ATM machine while I was standing there, and Emerald Ash Borer landed on him. That's how we discovered Emerald Ash Borer in Pennsylvania. Uh, we then quickly uh, did a survey. It was uh, quite widespread. And actually, this population, even though we discovered it in 2007, uh, if you recall, Emerald Ash Borer was first identified in Michigan in 2002, along with Windsor, Ontario. So this population in Pennsylvania had actually been there. When you look at the dendrochronology of the oldest infested sites, probably around 2000 or 1999. So before we ever identified Emerald Ash Borer as a problem in southeastern Michigan, it was already in Pennsylvania. So like a lot of other states, uh, we started doing quite a bit of survey work, starting with visual inspections and as, as researchers develop trap trees and the purple panel traps and the green traps, uh, we uh, uh, were involved with that, especially the Pennsylvania Department of Ag, our department, and uh, USDA uh, APHIS Plant Protection and Quarantine. This is a map showing the progression of detections in Pennsylvania. The most recent uh, find is up here in uh, McKean County, 2005. Only the uh, eastern part of the state, these 11 counties down here, we have not detected it. But as I tell people in those counties, just assume it's already there. Uh, we don't have any statewide um, uh, grids or trapping uh, that's going on. Most of it's done by uh, visual uh, uh, surveys uh, right, right now. So the whole state is quarantined. And um, so this is a progression of the detections. But in general, the emerald ash borer is moving northwards. And that's where our forests are along those northern tier counties uh, south of New York. And it's also moving eastward. In Pennsylvania, our principal uh, ash tree is white ash. Uh, we also have quite a bit of green ash. Um, both those are planted a lot in the urban situation. We do have some black ash, and that photo that's in the middle, that's pumpkin ash. 
and that's a rare species in Pennsylvania. We're quite concerned about that. It's only found in Erie County in far northwestern PA. And so we've actually located some of those trees and we continue to look for them and uh, one of our goals is to protect uh, that rare species. Uh, blue ash is on record for being in PA. Uh, it's outside its range. Uh, we've looked for it, um, can't seem to find it, but we do have some um, uh, blue ash planted in parks and in, in ornamental situation. So in PA, uh, we don't have as much ash as some of the Midwestern states. In our forest, it's only a little less than 4% of our, our forest, estimated at around 300 million trees. Uh, that's only our forest. Uh, you could probably nearly double that number of trees if you added the urban uh, ash trees that have been planted. It's obviously a tree that uh, is uh, used a lot in urban plantings and situations. If you were to look at the distribution in Pennsylvania, it is scattered throughout our forest, uh, but if you start looking at where it's concentrated, if just looking at areas greater than 10 square foot basal area, you can see it does shrink down quite a bit. But some of those areas along the northern tier counties are um, some very high quality ash. Matter of fact, Louisville Slugger gets a lot of their ash from baseball for baseball bats from that northern tier uh, in Pennsylvania. So just in general, uh, ash in Pennsylvania, it's not really a forest type, but it's very important from an ecosystem standpoint. It is, uh, especially white ash, it's the seventh most abundant hardwood species. Um, what's what's uh, happening now is we're monitoring it. It's still regenerating and growing in the forest, even though you saw that map where it's pretty well statewide. Uh, it's only really bad in uh, certain hot spots uh, in Pennsylvania uh, for right now. We have had, just like many other states, uh, a big public outreach effort about not moving firewood. That's more than likely how it got to Pennsylvania was by the movement of firewood. And Pennsylvania was actually, I think we were the first state to impose an exterior quarantine. You're not allowed to bring firewood into Pennsylvania unless it's been certified. And even though a brochure these days seems to be old school with all the social media, um, I can say this is about the fourth printing of this brochure. It's very popular. We've really, uh, distributed tens of thousands of these brochures. What's really important on the back is the contact uh, information. We have a bad bug at pa.gov, and that's actually um, where somebody can send in uh, information or photos and that's actually how we discovered it in central PA was actually through that um, that connection that e that email address. I'm going to start talking a little bit about our community plans and these are some of the communities we're working a lot with but before I get to that is, is how we develop that we actually worked in western Pennsylvania Allegheny County which is where Pittsburgh's located but the county itself has a very well developed park system and one of their parks, Allegheny County North Park, is a fairly large park. And uh, back in 2010, they were infested. Parts of the park were heavily infested. Other parts, it was light to moderate. And up in the northeastern corner of that park was a nature center. And actually, the, look, if you look at the photo on the right, there's some trails in there, there's a stream in there, and they had quite a bit of ash. So we thought that this was an opportunity to apply for one of the U.S. Forest Service's competitive grants to start and implement and test all the management tools. So we have a, a Nemer Lash Bore project. Uh, one of the principal things was focusing in on developing a plan for that Allegheny County Park. Uh, to begin releasing the biocontrol agents not only in that part but uh, on an additional park there in Allegheny County and as I mentioned we wanted to protect the the pumpkin ash and we also our Bureau of Forestry our Penn Nursery we have several ash seed orchards that have been developed over the years and we obviously wanted to protect those we were helping the Pennsylvania Department of Ag uh, we have 67 counties in PA um, at that time in 2010, 
they were uh, surveying the other uh, uh, 30 some counties and we surveyed the 35 counties that they were not surveying. We also looked into the possibility of the biosurveillance with the uh, beetle hunting wasp and of course we wanted to continue our uh, public education and outreach. So in Allegheny County we did a survey and laid out some experimental plots. We had 713 ash. Uh, working with the park, uh, some of the nearest uh, heavily infested uh, ash trees were removed and we identified 249 ash trees in, the, in that watershed and we were going to protect that with the triage insecticide, emmamectin benzoate. We've also released the parasitoids, uh, three species in 2011. We actually got recovery of two of those species the following year, so um, that was good news. And because that nature center was located right there, we did a lot of public outreach uh, using the park's uh, educational educators. Um, we trained them uh, and uh, provided them with materials. And then towards the end of the project, uh, we did uh, uh, an analysis and, and, and study of the plots. Um, one thing, too, that we did was after this program was over, we helped Allegheny County get some federal funding to do treatments in other uh, county parks to protect ash. Uh, we also did that with the city of Pittsburgh. So here's those, uh, uh, the, the trees that we're treating. Uh, we trained, uh, our staff came in and trained their staff so that they could do this into the, into the future. Uh, if you haven't seen the results of emmamectin benzoate, it does work. The, the tree on the, on the left is an ash tree down, just sort of outside our study area actually. Uh, it was a live ash tree in 2011. We treated it and you can see across the street those ash trees were barely hanging on in 2011 and 2012 they were all dead. Dealing with communities in Pennsylvania, I, I don't know how many uh, other states have this many uh, levels of government or government bodies um, below the state level, but we have lots of towns in the Commonwealth and boroughs and 2,629 different municipalities and in, 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 in governments. And um, I, I calculated that there's 260 work days in a year. And if I gave one presentation per day per, per, per community, it would take me 10 years to visit all of them. So we needed a better way of getting the word out. And we, uh, each of these, like the boroughs and the townships in the cities, and kind of, they have various associations that we've worked with and, and put on some uh, education and outreach. Well, Dr. Ho-Ping Liu is our forest entomologist. And actually, when uh, emerald ash borer was discovered in Michigan, he was actually working at Michigan State University and with the U.S. Forest Service Research Station there. And um, then I decided to uh, steal him away from Michigan, and he's on our staff. And he utilized a lot of the information that was being used and developed like, by folks like Cliff Sadoff at Purdue and some of the uh, uh, towns uh, and cities in the Midwest that prepared plans. And he researched all that, and we created a template for a community to follow to develop a plan to deal with their ash and the emerald ash borer. And uh, this plan and the other resources that he developed um, are all available on our website. So we needed to, a pilot test. We needed to start this someplace. So the borough of Westchester was selected as a model. And this is, just goes to show you where you know, you know people, you interact with people, you interact with communities, and, and, and we took advantage of this. The borough of Westchester happens to be right near where I live, and that photo on the lower right is Hoops Park within the, uh, the borough. Most of those trees you see standing there are ash trees, and if you see the pavilion up there at the top of the, at the, top of the uh, uh, hill there, every Arbor Day, I would do the Tree City USA presentation. Uh, borough of Westchester has been a tree city for like 25 years in a row. And I would give my little spiel about the ash trees in the back. Well, at Westchester University, Dr. Gerald Hertel, who used to work for the Forest Service in Forest Health Protection, and his uh, student that uh, worked with him at the Gord Preserve, Kedra McMillan, I uh, connected with those folks and our uh, 
Forest Service friends, Penn State Extension, and we came up with the idea, well, let's create the first management plan right here in Westchester. And that's what we did uh, back in 2012. Uh, they already had an inventory done. Um, we took their inventory, uh, or Kendra and, and Dr. Hertel, and did an ASH assessment and inventory and rating, and uh, came up with a plan. And they discovered that there was 127 ash trees that they were responsible for. The vast majority of them were in three parks. They had 18 street trees. Most of those weren't in very good condition or planted in poor locations. So over a 10-year period, they planned to remove those trees and treat the other 100, uh, uh, protect those 100 trees that were principally in those three, three parks. Now, mind you, in and around Westchester, which is in southeastern Pennsylvania, the emerald ash borer had not yet been detected. Uh, putting together their plan, we figured out their insecticide cost and the benefits, et cetera, went in front of the, the borough council, and the council appropriated funds to begin the application. And the next, that year, I also applied for them uh, or, or with them to receive U.S. Forest Service funding, just $25,000 but it got them going to buy equipment, uh, hire a contractor, and, and begin treating their trees. This happens to be one of their parks. Uh, that actually happens to be the largest ash tree that they found. That's 61 inches in diameter, so they began those treatments uh, uh, in 2013, and they, uh, excuse me, they, uh, uh, plan to revisit those trees. Uh, half the trees were done in 2013, half were done in 2014. Uh, this year they're going to evaluate and see if they need to go back. Probably not because the emerald ash borer hasn't yet been detected and uh, they might be able to get a, 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 an extra year or two out of their treatments. Then in 2013, uh, in conjunction with our Pennsylvania uh, community Forestry uh, Forest Council, we applied for some federal funding, which we got, to deal with 10 communities and develop these plans in these various communities. S originally, seven of them already had tree inventories done and three needed a tree inventory. Uh, we had a couple, uh, two or three communities drop out and we also added some, like uh, State College and Williamsport were added later in, in Tioga County. I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, were added later. But Easton, Lancaster, Lewisburg, Philly, State College, Williamsport, and actually all of these, our community Emerald Ash Borer intern who did that and wrote that first plan in Westchester, we hired her to be the intern to go around and work with these communities to help them do assessments get them trained, and help write their plans. So again, we used the template that Hoping had developed and the plan from Westchester. And these are the various components, the most important of which is identifying um, not only who, the responsibility within that community, so if they've got various tree ordinance laws, it's, it's, it's cited there. Looking at the ash resources, where, where are their ash trees? What are their condition? And then using information, for instance, that Cliff Sadoff from Purdue provided on the cost and the benefits. And that was very instrumental in being able to explain to the, the folks who control the pocketbooks in those communities, you have to show them that cost-benefit analysis. So this is the template that we followed for each of these communities. Uh, this is an example of one of them. Lewisburg is in the central part of the state. And they were moderately infested at, at the time of the, the surveys were done with emerald ash borer. Uh, they had already had their street tree inventory done. Uh, 249 were ash trees. They hired a couple uh, interns uh, with the help of Kendra, uh, finding them for them. And each community was given up to $5,000 through that grant to do their assessment and develop their plan. What was unique about um, Lewisburg is they had some parks there that had some really nice, decent ash trees in them that were starting to get infested, and they did a sale. 
and they were actually able to get some utilization out of that uh, ash wood. They did plan to treat 42 trees, which they did themselves in, in 2014. Uh, we have been pushing the ash utilization. This is a photo of a nice ash tree from the city of Detroit. You can see there's a lot of good uh, wood there. Um, the, uh, it's only the surface of the uh, outer part that contains the insect. You can uh, still get some, if you cut the tree early enough uh, before it gets too heavily infested, the, the wood is still, still usable. So we've been uh, really pushing the ash utilization. Getting back to Lewisburg, what Kendra would do uh, once the community hired some interns, they would uh, get a map, they would grid the area, and then she would do the training of those people on how to do an ash tree assessment and the types of materials that they needed. Uh, she uh, got a list for them. They could buy whatever they needed using the $5,000 that they got or up to $5,000. And the other thing that uh, Kendra did was a very simple uh, ash tree assessment flow chart. You start up in the upper left corner there. Is the tree alive or dead? Then where is it located? And that's pretty important. Some communities have historical or specimen trees, or you got public areas, or you have your street parks and recreation areas. And then some places have forested areas or industrial areas. And you just work down through this, and you're making decisions as you go along, especially on the health of the tree, poor or fair trees, anything over 30, 25, 30 percent in decline uh, is not a good candidate for control. And so we help them make their decisions as to what trees they wish to protect or not. Utilizing what folks like uh, uh, Cliff Sadoff produced at, at Purdue and was utilized in some of the Midwestern states. There's four op management options. Um, some of our uh, communities have kind of intermixed this. Uh, the no action is where you don't do anything. You just wait till your trees die, and then you have to remove all those hazard trees at once. And you have to remember that within three to five years after infestation, these uh, trees become, uh, well, they'll die, and they become, ash trees become very, very brittle, become very dangerous. And that's the problem with ash. Sometimes it's actually hard to hire a certified arborist uh, to come in and remove an ash tree uh, once it's become infested and, and is dying. So this option is you don't do anything. You just wait till the trees die and then take down, their, take down your hazard trees. The most popular uh, 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 management option is a selective management option. Uh, using the cost benefit analysis and, and the cost uh, uh, resources that uh, Cliff Sadoff produced at Purdue, they, uh, you can plug this in and you can show that actually treating some of the trees and saving them is actually more cost effective than just removing all the trees. So a lot of our communities have some high value ash trees. Uh, we look at the health of those trees, where they're located, and they make plans to either chemically retreat or remove the tree or remove it and replace it. The preemptive management is uh, you're not yet infested or you are infested or starting to get infested and you're going to just remove all your ash trees and, um, and replant with something else. Uh, the no treatment cost is not necessarily, um, sometimes you would have treatment cost to extend the life of the tree so not all of your trees die at one time. You can spread the removal of those trees out over a period of time by doing some insecticide treatments. And the last is a pretty aggressive where all the healthy ash trees, you're going to try to protect as many as possible. Um, you're going to use chemical control. Um, as trees die, uh, you're going to remove and replace them. If you've got some natural areas, they can work with us. Um, the borough of Westchester and um, Westchester University D does have an area called the Gordon Preserve that has quite a bit of ash in it. When that area starts to get infested, it's an ideal location to do a parasitoid release. And this is a, just a summary of those various um, management options and the various uh, control methods. Now, what about those three communities that didn't have the tree inventory done? This is all part of that same grant, and we picked three communities that were near 
uh, a nearby college or university that had a GIS department and biology department. And what our rural and community forestry section uh, did, uh, Ellen Rowan uh, was, was the lead on this, we put together some iTree workshops to train students that were then going to um, do the tree inventory and enter that data into the iTree tools. If you're not familiar with this, it was developed by the U.S. Forest Service and Davy Tree. The software is free online. I mean, most states put on workshops and training sessions, but actually it is pretty easy to use and uh, you can actually do some uh, self, uh, teach yourself this and it has various applications that you can use. Uh, what's great about it is uh, you can actually calculate the benefits provided by the trees. So you can get a dollar value and this is really important when you go to uh, a, a city council or a township council and you're asking for, for funding. So the other thing that we did, I always get this question, how much does it cost to treat a tree? And I, I always answer, it depends on the size of the tree. So one of the things that's done during the assessment is, is the health of the trees looked at, the location of the trees recorded, and then the diameter at breast height, DBH. And the reason why you collect that is because the insecticide rate that you use and the amount that you use is based on the diameter of the tree. And uh, this is an Excel spreadsheet. This is available on our website. Uh, all you have to do is figure out your cost of, per liter of the insecticide. There's a, a, a cell down at the bottom. You just put in, uh, for this here, it's, uh, uh, I think, $559, something like that, per liter. Uh, you just change that number. It'll recalculate the whole table. But when you go do your survey, if you've got 10, 10 trees or, or, or one tree, that's 11 inches in diameter. You just enter that in there. It'll calculate the cost. Down at the bottom of the table, it will then tell you how much insecticide you need, how much it's going to cost, and actually we also make a, 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 an estimate as to the application cost. Uh, triage or emmectin benzoate is a restricted use pesticide. A homeowner cannot buy that. You have to be a certified pesticide applicator in order to use this material. And in addition, that applicator has to be trained on how to inject it into the tree. Kendra, uh, also our EAB intern, produced a nice table to help a community develop a 10-year budget plan. So each tree's entered in there, the health, the diameter, and whether you're going to do chemical control, whether you're going to, the cost of removing that tree and the cost of replacing that tree. And actually, as you go uh, each year, there's actually a 2% annual increase uh, to help um, uh, if, if cost and removal cost and replanting cost uh, go up. So each of those communities had up to $5,000. Some of them didn't need all of it. This will show you the number of interns and in-house staff that was used how many trees from their inventory, or at least where they did their survey, and then how many ash trees they came up with, and their action plan um, that uh, most of them picked of the selective, and they're going to do some of those ash trees that are identified there, a proportion of those will be treated uh, in the coming year. The three uh, cities that needed the inventory, those universities got additional funding, I think up to $10,000 to help get the inventory done. When they were done, then Kendra McMillan uh, met with those communities and trained them to do their uh, street tree or ash tree uh, uh, assessment. This is a unique thing that happened up in Tioga County, which is a rural county in northern uh, Pennsylvania on the New York border, the borough of Wellsboro up there. And then actually there was a few other townships. Deerfield Township was one. And they were kind of scattered all over the place. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with the cooperative weed management areas. Well, we took that concept and created a cooperative pest management area. And the Tioga County Conservation District is the lead agency. So again, uh, Kendra went up there, put them in touch with some local uh, 
universities got some in-house uh, or some interns uh, trained and some in-house staff trained and they did their uh, uh, tree inventory and their ash tree uh, uh, assessment. Now I haven't heard about this yet. I think the Forest Service in the northeastern area is still figuring out their budget. But we did submit for six of those communities uh, a treatment proposal to get federal funding through our department uh, and from the federal government. And they would put up a 50-50 match. So these six communities have a total of 1,328 trees that they wish to treat this coming year. and we're asking for $136,000 from the U.S. Forest Service to um, help them implement their first year of treatment in 2015 based on the management plans that they produced. And all of these plans, by the way, are posted on our website. So you can download them and take a look at them if you want. We continue to work with like the Pennsylvania Township Association and getting the word out and try to get other communities um, uh, involved in, in the program. Now our parks. Uh, we have quite a few state parks and virtually every resident in the states within 25 miles of one of our parks. The, the bottom bullet there, that's what's really important. There's lots of campsites, lots of infrastructure, lots of parking lots, lots of area, trails and a lot of ash is either planted or occurs naturally in our park system. So we were concerned about that. In South Central PA is uh, Greenwood Furnace State Park. They were becoming infested with the emerald ash borer. So we thought that that would be a good starting point to develop a plan for our state parks where we then uh, address all the various management options, include all the detailed know-how that we learned from the Midwestern states and from our experiences in Allegheny County, uh, that North Park. And also then provide list of information and references. So again, we use that template. This plan is also available on our website. Uh, did the same thing, uh, did a tree inventory, put on some workshops, uh, uh, developed plans to remove hazard trees, uh, did training for uh, park staff, and forest district staff to uh, do, do, do the treatments. And by the way, on the workshops, we actually had four last year that were very, very, went very, very well. And we're actually planning another one for Northwestern PA uh, this coming June. Now our state forest. We have an ash resource. So we are con concerned about that. So how are we going to conserve ash or conserve ash genetics um, and deal with some of our rare, like the pumpkin ash, um, or if we find blue ash, and how are we going to mitigate some of the negative impacts on our state forest system? Well, we developed the state forest ash management plan. Uh, Dr. Hoping Liu and Scott Miller from our civil culture section were the principal authors. And our objectives are to manage ash as a, ash as a component of the forest, protect the threatened ash species, mitigate negative impacts, uh, not use civil culture to slow the emerald ash borer down. That's, that, that's not possible, but look at where um, some economic value, if, 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 if ash is a component of the forest and it's ready to be harvested, uh, uh, timber harvest, let's take advantage of that. The big thing is protecting our seed orchards and collecting seeds. And then, of course, the training and, and outreach. And all the different forest districts and components within our uh, Bureau of Forestry are involved in this plan. Um, includes tree removal, but we have different units uh, looking at that. Um, mainly, this is a hazard situation uh, near picnic areas or trails or uh, roads and right-of-ways. Uh, the biocontrol option, uh, we are still looking for really good release sites and our division of forest pest management in conjunction with our forest districts will um, will handle that. And chemical control, we're doing a lot of treatments. Uh, we run everything through our natural heritage inventory review. Um, a lot of data collecting. We uh, uh, did about 400 trees were protected last year. Our goal is to protect 
uh, the various species, upwards of around 3,600, 3,700 trees across the state. And the reason for that is once ash is removed from the forest, it does not seed bank very well. So we want to be able to protect some seed producing trees scattered um, uh, in pockets across the 20 forest districts. Uh, we treated about 400 trees last year. We have plans to treat about 1,700 trees this year. Our target's around 3,600, 3,700 trees. I'm um, not going to spend too much time on this. We actually don't have that many um, ash stands where that exceed 25% basal area. Um, we, uh, except for we did ask our forest districts to go through their inventory and management units to see if they had any, any sites. Uh, there were a few that we're looking at. Um, we're actually discouraging any pre-salvage of ash. We, uh, most of the ash is in non-timber sites or wet sites, so we actually want the emerald ash borer to come through and hopefully find some of that lingering ash. Um, it does kill 99% of the ash, and they're looking at this in the Midwest. Uh, Dan Herms at Ohio State and Jennifer Koch, U.S. Forest Service Research, Deb McCullough and others are looking at that lingering ash issue. So we want to be able to identify uh, those uh, trees if possible. Uh, again, we're having folks look at road buffers, and you, so you get situations like this where these are infested and dead and dying trees that are in picnic areas and along roads, and they need to be removed. Uh, they're, they, they create uh, um, they're a, a very high hazard, or even areas, pockets of ash that are near recreation areas. Um, this was part of a salvage. It was easily accessible. And you got a pocket of, of ash there that's that's dead and dying. And uh, one of our districts in the central part of the state that's been hit very hard by the emerald ash borer. Uh, these are basically trees that are near roadsides that are marketable, and we're able to um, salvage uh, those trees. Again, the biocontrol we started that in 2011. We've gotten uh, recovery of the egg parasitoid obius and spathius. Uh, but not the not the other one. Uh, we have three sites. We actually have five sites statewide, but three sites in um, parks or um, state forest lands. Chemical control. Um, on our front, we do a lot. We did a lot of training last year. That's why we only got 400 trees done. Uh, spent a lot of time getting some of the equipment and did a lot of training for staff to to do the injections. This has been really important to us. We've been doing seed collection since about 2004 for ash. Uh, send it to cold storage so it can be used for either storage or research. Uh, we also want our staffs out there, our foresters, looking for um, uh, ash resistance or tolerance and, and provide those locations to us so that we can send that along to the various researchers. We are looking for blue ash. Actually, this tree down in the lower right-hand corner was the first tree treated in the borough of Westchester. It's kind of funny because it, it had a sign on it that said Fraxinus species. We're all standing around looking at it, and we're going, is that a white ash? What is that thing? Found out later that ash tree was planted in 1850 in the park. And so we are looking for additional um, blue ash uh, throughout the state. One thing that's been very helpful internally, we've developed a newsletter that's published throughout the field season. We write article keeps everybody up to date about the progress, if we've got any meetings, uh, data. Uh, we have a little tree counter there on how many trees that we've treated to date. And again, it's an internal one. Uh, we're going to produce it from April to September. And it basically just keeps everybody on board. So we've been able to implement our plan. We've done chemical control both in our ash seed orchards. We've done 800 trees. We're buying equipment, or buying a lot more equipment uh, this year. We've done some salvage work. And our future work is to get our data entered seamlessly into our forest information management system for our bureau. And each of the districts are preparing their uh, uh, plans for the coming year and future years. And the uh, ash management plan is available online. And just a little note, Ho Ping Lu and Scott Miller won a department secretary's award 
for their work on this plan. So congratulations to Hoping and Scott. The, the, the message here is you need a plan before the problem becomes too big. Um, I always joked that that emerald ash borer was found near Three Mile Island, but uh, not really. Uh, we had an artist from that the Penn State folks knew prepared some of these large models for us that were uh, going to, uh, uh, that we take to shows and stuff like that. So, in summary, this is not just another forest pest. It's going to kill 98, 99 percent. That's what they're seeing in the Midwest. That's what we're seeing in the high infestations here. It happens quickly. Um, that our, one of our district foresters in the central part of the state a few years ago says, I don't think I'm going to really have much of a problem. I must not have much ash. The next year, he says, oh, I guess I got a lot of ash. The third year, he said, holy cow, look at all the dead ash. And it happens very suddenly. Uh, for communities and parks and trails and recreation, you have the increased hazard. You have, to, you have to look and do an assessment of your ash. And if you don't have it yet, treat early uh, before you detect it because the treatment is a great preventative uh, measure. And anybody in Pennsylvania that's uh, uh, listening to the presentation and you need help with your community, give us a call. Um, there's my number. Uh, there's the web page and uh, phone numbers and emails for uh, Hope Hang and myself. And are there any questions? Okay, Joe from New Jersey. What emerald ash borer population density or level of infestation was used in determining the areas for parasitoid releases? That's a very good question, Joe. Uh, you actually have to have the in insect there. The problem uh, for any of those folks that have been involved in, in surveying and monitoring, we do not have a very good early detection tool. So the only traps being put up in Pennsylvania are along our northern tier. And it, if it gets anywhere close to those areas that we're going to treat for the seed, and if we detect it anywhere in the area, we're going to start releasing the parasitoids uh, into that site. Can we get a model of the EAB and larva for New Jersey? <laughs> Um, sorry, uh, that was a few years ago. Penn State Extension had a grant to get that done. Um, I don't think they're making any more, but uh, invite us. We'll uh, uh, come over and you can borrow it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dan. This is interesting. Um, I just have one question kind of after the, um, that kind of um, goes after the, the predation. Are you seeing predation of, of EAB by those parasitoids, uh, quite a bit of it, or? How is that going? Not a lot. We just started releasing in 2011. So we were just happy to get recovery of the two of them. So that, and that's another trick with the, um, uh, it gets back to Joe's question about population density, is that the ideal thing is, is that you would release it when it's very light infestation so that they can get established and attack the population. Normally, you end up releasing in a moderate to heavy infestation, and then the trees die. Now, the parasitoids are really good at finding the emerald ash borer, but you kind of like to want to get them established. So that's why we're going to focus in on these areas that we're going to protect for seed producing. We're going to start releasing those parasitoids in those areas. There's a question uh, in stands greater than 25% ash, are these primarily upland or lowland sites? Um, mainly it's our white ash, so it's more upland. Uh, will you be using clear cutting or single tree selection or other harvest methods? We, uh, we won't be doing, actually we actually haven't found any stands yet that we're going to do that. That's the recommendation to our district foresters. They would just follow our normal, in other words, that stand would be ready with along the other species to be harvested and ash is a component of that. So we're not doing clear cutting. Uh, the single tree selection would be for hazard trees, like around uh, road buffers where you've got ash and um, you're not going to protect those ash. So we'll do single tree. That, you saw that one picture of all the logs uh, lying alongside the road. Uh, that was principally all ash. And that's a good question. How many more pancakes can the rabbit hold on its head? I, don't, I didn't try. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, I'm posting. Thank you, Kendra. I'm my, posting the um, the survey link that we would like you to um, uh, check out and respond to if that if you could. We we are really fortunate that the USDA Forest Service. Um, is providing funds for everyone to see the, all their presentations on Emerald Ashbor University for free. So the more they like us, um, the more that's liable to continue. If we can get some feedback from you folks, that would really be appreciated. And again, this is being recorded. So um, uh, if you know of anyone that was not able to see it today, it will be posted here in the next couple of days on the emeraldashbor.info website. So, Robin, if I answer the, um, the, the survey, do I get an EABU goodie bag? Yes, you do. We would make sure that you got one. <laughs> and even if you didn't, we would probably give you one because you've been such a good presenter today. Um, I've got a question on the pumpkin ash. It's not prevalent in PA. It's actually outside of its range, and I don't think it will be in New Jersey. Um, the only location is one county, Erie County, in northwestern PA. That's the only place that we found pumpkin ash. So what are the plans for regenerating stands that are largely dominated by white ash sugar maple, one species we don't want to regenerate? and the other that is notoriously hard to regenerate across the Allegheny Plateau. Yes, um, sugar maple is having um, its own problems, and the it, right now ash is seeding in nicely because it, we don't have large stretches yet. That's the whole point of keeping some of those seed producing ash trees alive in the forest because the seed bank goes away. If you remove the ash and the ash die, it does not uh, seed bank very well. So that's why we want to keep our ash seed orchards going. That's why we want to keep trees in the forest going. And that's why we're um, uh, cooperating as best we can if we find lingering ash, letting the um, uh, researchers on that at uh, uh, U.S. Forest Service, Ohio State, Michigan State, and others that are working on that, let them know where that lingering ash is. There is some good news about white ash, um, uh, their chemical difference. If you stop and think about it, uh, it's such a heavy selection pressure, you're basically selecting for the tail end of the, of the bell curve there. So they are looking at that and maybe they can develop some of that tolerance or resistance or maybe the way they did it with chestnut because um, Asian ash is resistant to the emerald ash borer. I think we got somebody else's typing. It looks like we, yes, we probably, we've got about seven more minutes, folks. So anyone who has a question, now is the time to ask it. So we usually wrap these up um, in an hour. Should we be limited on planting, is that the white fringe tree? Okay, um, I think the story with the white fringe tree, it's in the same family as Fraxinus oleaceae, and I think um, uh, maybe Cliff can type in, uh, it was found in Ohio, and what I think happened was it was an area that's been heavily hit by emerald ash borer, so a lot of the ash trees were dead. And so here you are, an, an emerald ash borer flying around trying to find an ash tree. And it, it, my, the way my thinking went on it is, is it, geez, that sort of smells like an ash tree, even though it's not quite an ash tree. And it did attack it. Um, I think they found dead. Um, they did find some emergence holes, um, but they also found dead. So I think it was just uh, a case of there's a lot of emerald ash borer in the area and not very much ash and it attacked that white fringe tree uh, that's in the same family as Fraxinus. So I wouldn't limit your planting of that. 
Oh, good. Cliff's weighing in. See what Cliff has to say. Oh, there was an earlier uh, webinar um, on this. And again, I think that was just, uh, I don't think they found it in any other way. I think it was just the one tree in the one location. Oh, several trees. Okay. And uh, Robin just posted that there is actually a recorded webinar on, on that situation, so you can check that out. No, I hadn't heard that it was several trees there. Yeah, see, in Chicago and Detroit areas, those are heavily hit by emerald ash borer. So it, I, to me, it kind of makes sense that it's going to attack something that is closely related or somewhat related. And it's not an epidemic by any measure, says Cliff. And I know that uh, Dr. Cipollini also said that they are doing host um, studies uh, as far as um, you know the um, aged experiments where they put the fringe tree. Oh, in good. And he's working with the USDA APHIS on that. Oh, good. So maybe we will know if they're going to, you know, um, consider that a host. Hmm. Well, it, it, I mean, it is something to consider in the post uh, when EAB gets very, very um, high in an area and it's killed a lot of the ash trees. It seems to me that that's going to be under, it could, could attack it. I guess that's what they're looking into. I would check out the other re uh, webinar. Uh, what do we do with infected trees that we cut down in order to stop the spread of EAB? Well, actually, we're not really cutting trees down to stop the spread of EAB, at least not here in Pennsylvania. Uh, you're basically removing infected trees because once they get past a certain point, you can't save that tree anyway. Once the damage is done, the larvae feed below the bark, it girdles the tree, that's how it kills it. So uh, as long as you don't, I mean, you can chip up the wood. If it's, a, it's something that you could use the wood, uh, uh, it's only the outer part that's not any good. Uh, if you're going to use it for firewood, don't transport it anywhere else because that's how it gets around. Um, but we're basically not doing that anymore of cutting trees down to stop the spread of EAB. The EAB is in 25 states. It's as far west as Colorado. It's just reported in Louisiana. It's in Georgia. Um, I think Vermont and Delaware are the only northeastern mid-Atlantic states not yet where it's been detected. It's in Quebec and Ontario, so it's pretty widespread. Actually, just uh, on another invasive species, Asian longhorn beetle, um, they do cut down infected trees and host trees to stop the spread of it. But that moves slower than EAB. We've got another minute. So I see we've got a couple people typing. So um, we'll try to wrap this up around at the top of the hour. So I know that uh, I'm sure Dr. Egan has some work to do so he can come back again and update us on what's going on in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania maybe next year. Um, and. Uh, Meanwhile, thank you so much for giving us all this great information. I mean, this is, I'm also asked very often, um, what are some of the management plans? What are, other, what are other places doing? You know, we want to be proactive. We need to have some examples. So this is great. And we'll, like I said, we will be posting this webinar um, on the emerald info site, um, the EAB on demand. So. Someone asked if the cold winter has been um, any effect. Um, emerald ash borer is from China. 
they get the same weather we do. Uh, maybe in thin bark trees you can get some uh, mortality, but it, it's doing quite well. 